In this video, we're going to discuss airflow calculations with regard to mechanical systems. Now, before we get into that a little more, I want to kind of explain what I mean by mechanical systems. So, with mechanical systems, I mean the ones found in building systems. So, within building systems, uh, there are three main disciplines that are in there, and there are MEP systems, or mechanical, electrical, and plumbing systems. Now, these, of course, are very broad topics, which then can be broken down into subtopics or subcategories or disciplines. As you can see, there's a bunch of them here, and of course, we're not going to go through all of these. I just want to make sure that we're clear that the airflow calculations that we're going to be talking about today are specifically within the MEP discipline of mechanical, and more spe specifically, the HVAC discipline, and HVAC stands for Heating, Ventilation, and air conditioning. So before we get into that any further, let's just take a look at some basic heating system ideas, right? So the purpose of a heating system is to overcome or neutralize the heat loss of a building, right? So in the middle of winter, when it's freezing outside, we don't want to be freezing inside. And on the flip side, when it's hot outside, we don't want it to be hot inside, right? So we're just trying to find a way to neutralize the heat transfer whether it's going in or going out so that we're comfortable right and we do that by maintaining a predetermined temperature so when we maintain that predetermined temperature it's for a couple reasons of course it's to ensure that we are comfortable but it's also to make sure that we're not overusing or, or overtaxing or, or working our equipment so we don't have these huge fluctuations of going hot to cold hot to cold and short cycling our equipment because that uh, that isn't very efficient and also uh, it makes for a shorter lifespan of our uh, HVAC systems and also by doing that makes it a little less comfortable for us as well. So with heat let's talk about some different types of heat transfer and this may look familiar from back in maybe I don't know your, your physics days back in in high school or, or, or whenever uh, but we have here a source of heat and our source of heat is going to be our campfire logs which are going through that chemical process we like to call fire and as that chemical process is occurring several things happen we give uh, it gives off light and it gives off heat and it gives off heat in a couple of different ways we could transfer that heat in a couple of different ways i should say so for example if we take our hands and we put them right over the top of the fire we can feel feel that heat by way of convection. Now, if we take our fire poker or metal rod and we hang on to it with a gloved hand, of course, the end of that rod is going to get warm and that heat is going to conduct up that metal rod until it reaches our hand. So that way it's transferring by conduction. Now, another way that we can uh, experience heat transfer is if we're sitting on the side of the campfire and we just kind of, you know, rubbing our hands together and, and putting our hands next to the fire to try to keep warm, we can experience radiation heat or radiant heat coming off that fire. So the neat thing about this is it's, you know, it, it's simple physics, right? But uh, everything that we do in the HVAC world with regard to comfort heating and comfort cooling re relates around heat transfer. Right? So we can always go back to you know, a simple campfire to help us remember what types of heat transfer there are. Now let's take a look at how heat reacts with our buildings. Right? And there's two terms that we use, and it's heat loss and heat gain. All right? So uh, let's take first a look at heat gain. So heat gain is the energy entering a building. So, for example, on our home on the left-hand side here, we have the hot summer sun beating down onto our house, and therefore our house is absorbing that, uh, that heat energy, and it's getting warmer. It's gaining heat. So, therefore, we need a cooling system when we have a high heat gain. Now, on the flip side, we have a heat loss or energy leaving the building, in which case we would need a heating system. So as we can see by the arrows here, a little cloudier day, uh, we have heat that's inside of the building and heat wants to go to cold and it's gonna do that, it's gonna go out. Now, uh, one thing I wanna point out is a lot of people will say, oh, heat rises, it always rises, which yes, heat does rise. But there's also something about heat is heat goes to cold. So even if we have a cold floor, you know, 
picture yourself in a in an unheated garage with a concrete slab floor. That concrete slab is always cold unless you have you know in floor warming or something like that. So heat goes to cold. It doesn't just rise. Heat goes to cold. Remember, it's an important part of our our heat loss and heat gain calculations. All right. So how do we measure heat loss and gain, or just heat in general? Well, we do it with something called a BTU or a British thermal unit. So let's see what that is. So a British thermal unit is a basic measurement of heat. All right, and the scientific definition for it is one BTU is the amount of heat required to raise the temperature of one pound of water by one degree Fahrenheit. All right, so let's just assume that we have a beaker of water here that's full of one pound of water, and we have a uh, a single match down here. If it if this match can raise the temperature of this pound of water by one degree Fahrenheit, this match is equal to one BTU. Now it's no coincidence that this is a match because in reality, a typical match and even like a birthday candle, like a standard birthday candle, is equivalent to about one BTU. Right now, one thing that kind of gets us folks here in the United States a little wonky sometimes is we look at this and say, well, this one BTU is the amount of heat required to raise the temperature of one pound of water. It's like we don't measure water in pounds. We measure water in volume, right? So let's take a look at that in an easy way to remember that. So a pound of water is equal to one pint. All right, so here we have a nice pint of Dr. Pepper hanging out over there. That is about one pound of fluid. All right, so the way that I remember this, and I don't remember who I heard it from. It's been around for a billion years, I'm sure. But the way I remember this is a pint a pound the world around. All right, so if I'm ever curious of how much a pint is and volume-wise, it's a pint because a pint a pound the world around. A little cheesy, I know, but it works. All right, so let's take that idea of a British thermal unit and let's talk about the, the concept of heat loss, okay? So we have a building here and it's obviously losing heat because our arrows are going outside because heat goes to cold and this, therefore we know that it's colder outside than it is inside. And let's say that we lose one BTU of loss, all right? So our goal is to neutralize that load and maintain a temperature. Therefore, we're going to put one matchstick in because one matchstick is equivalent to about one BTU, right? And therefore, we've neutralized our load so we can maintain a temperature inside the building. Now, let's get you know really crazy and extreme and say we lose three BTUs, right? So if we lose three BTUs, again, pretty simple. All we have to do is make sure that we put three BTUs in, again, to neutralize that load. Right now, of course, we're not going to heat a house with just three matchsticks, right? But this is just to, to kind of drive home the neutralization efforts that we have when it comes to um, heat loss. All right, so let's take a look at the actual airflow calculations. That's why we're here today. So airflow calculations are necessary to ensure that heating and cooling systems are designed in a way that move the correct amount of heat energy through a building by means of an air system. All properly designed systems need to have airflow calculations, whether it's done by hand or done by computer, whatever it may be, a good system, a proper system has calculations. Now, this doesn't always happen, right? And we've, you, if you haven't seen it, you're going to see it, that there's a lot of bad stuff out there. So a nice thing about airflow calculations is that they're also a key component for troubleshooting air system problems, right? The, our, our airflow calculations are kind of our lie detectors and our truth tellers with regard to uh, if a system is operating correctly. Um, and if it's not, what might be the problem? Is it the, is it the burner? Is it the blower? Is it the ductwork? What's the problem with our system? Now, before we get into actually doing any of our uh, calculations, let's take a look at some terms that we're going to use. Now, the first term is a BTUH. Right, so last time, the last uh, time we talked about BTU, it was simply a BTU, All right? And it's also called BTU. This is also called BTU. They're called the exact same thing, but the addition of this one is it has the H, all right? And what that H is, it's the amount of heat energy, or a BTU, over the duration of one hour, all right? So again, if I were to take a matchstick or a simple birthday candle and burn it for a full hour, that would be a B 
B-T-U-H, or B-T-U. Now, the great thing about this, you're saying, whoa, 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 hang on. You know, B-T-U and B-T-U are the same thing. How do I know what someone's going to be talking about? Well, the typical measurement for heating appliances is this, is the B-T-U-H, is the B-T-U's per hour, as opposed to just B-T-U. Okay, so if going forward, anytime you hear BTU, when they're talking about uh, a furnace or a boiler or a gas appliance, whatever it may be, you can rest assured that it's going to be BTUH unless otherwise specified. All right, the second term that we're going to use is CFM. And CFM is a measurement of airflow in cubic feet per minute, hence the CFM, cubic feet per minute. And this is the volume of air moved over the duration of one minute. So imagine if I had, you know, I'm a fan and um, um, I have a, a one cubic foot box and it's full of air. How many of those boxes can I move in 60 seconds or the course of one minute, right? It's just a volume of air movement. So uh, I'm a pretty visual person. So for me, uh, I like to say that a CFM, and I relate it back to a bathroom, like a residential bathroom fan. And a typical residential bathroom fan can move anywhere between 50 to 75 CFM in most cases. That just gives you an idea of measurement of, of, of what a CFM is and, and kind of put a visual aspect to it. So a residential bathroom fan is around 50 to 75 CFM. All right, the last term that we're going to look at here is delta T. All right, we have the Greek letter delta here and just a capital T. And delta means change. And T stands for the temperature in degrees Fahrenheit. Therefore, we have delta T is the change in temperature. So let's take an look at an example at that. So the first example. This morning, the outdoor temperature was 5 degrees Fahrenheit. This afternoon, the temperature was 35 degrees Fahrenheit. Therefore, the delta T is 30 degrees. All right, so the temperature difference between when I started and when I ended is 30 degrees, because 35 minus 5 is 30. So my delta T is 30 degrees. Let's take a look at another example. So example two, a can of soda at room temperature is 68 degrees. After the can was in the refrigerator for a day, the temperature of the soda was 40 degrees. Therefore, the delta T is 28 degrees Fahrenheit. So again, I started with a can of soda at room temperature at 68 degrees. I threw it in the fridge and it came out at 40. So my delta is 28 because I start with 68, I subtract 40, and I get 28. So my delta T is 28. Now take a note here. So the delta T is always a positive value regardless if the temperature went up or the temperature went down. So let's take a look at our examples. In example one, I went from 5 degrees to 35 degrees. My temperature went up, right? And I still have a delta T of 30. In the second example, my can of soda went from room temperature to a nice cold can of soda, or right? the temperature went down. But you'll notice that my delta T's are still positive values. Your delta T should always be positive. Therefore, the calculations that you're going to see will work for both heating and cooling because we can change the delta T regardless if we're going up in temperature or down in temperature. The delta is still positive. All right, so let's take a look at our actual airflow formula. All right, now this is nice and big for a reason. So you should be writing this one down because this is going to be your best friend. Uh, quite honestly, when I got involved in the HVAC field you know, 20 plus years ago now, this is one of the first calculations that I was told. And I still have the same note that I wrote down. Of course, it's, I transposed out some different papers here and there, but I use this calculation all of the time. All right, so our, our formula is BTU is equal to CFM times delta T times 1.08. All right, so let's break this down. So we know what our BTU is. It's a measurement of heat. That equals a CFM, which is a measurement of airflow, times our delta T, which is a change in temperature in degrees Fahrenheit. And then we have times 1.08. We're going to call this our convenience factor or the magic. All right, so 
rest assured, this 1.08 comes from something. All right, it comes from a very long and complicated calculation that goes back to the specific heat of standard air. All right, or you know the the characteristics of standard air. I can assure you, I will never do a video on that because that is a calculation that just goes on for days. All right, so uh, for all intents and purposes, we just need our magic number, which is 1.08. Now, the great thing about this formula is it works frontwards, backwards, upside down, right? We can manipulate this formula to do whatever we want, and we're going to have a little bit of practice with this. But also, this is with specifically with regard to airflow. There is a very similar formula which is used for the flow of fluids, specifically water, where we could take um, you know, a boiler, like a, a water boiler system, and we can do similar calculations to find the BTU using water. I'll do that in a future video, but this is just for airflow. All right, so now that we have our terms in place and we have our formula written down, let's do some practice. All right, so this first practice, this first scenario, we're going to do this one together. And the second one, uh, I'm going to give you some time to do it on your own. So scenario one, you have been asked to find an appropriate replacement for a gas-fired furnace that is nearing the end of its useful life. Unfortunately, the model number is unable to be read, and a service technician has provided you with the CFM and delta T of the unit. All right, so we need to replace this, this furnace. We need to know how big it needs to be, how many BTUs it needs to be capable of, but all we have are two values, which being the CFM and the delta T. So let's break this down into a solution. So the first thing that we need to do is we need to use our equation. All right, again, our equation is BTU equals CFM times delta T times 1.08. Now, the second thing that we're going to do is we are going to replace our variables with what we know. All right, so we know our CFM and we know our delta T. So therefore, I'm going to rewrite my equation. So now a BTU equals 1400 CFM times 20, which is my delta T, times my magic number of 1.08. Now I'm going to work the formula. All right, and the way that I like to work the formula is I like to take my first two variables and I'll multiply, or in this case, I'll multiply them. And then I'll just bring down my magic number. And simplify things a bit. So BTU equals 28,000 times 1.08. And if I work that math out, my BTUs are equal to 30,240 BTUs. So therefore, I need to find a furnace for this scenario that can at least put out 30,240 BTUs into my space. All right, let's take a look at another scenario. All right, so again, for this scenario, we'll read it through. I'll give you the variables, and then I'll ask you to pause the video and work it through. And when you think you have a solution, go ahead and play the video again, and we'll work through the solution. So scenario two, same scenario. You have been asked to find an appropriate replacement for a gas-fired furnace that is nearing the end of its useful life. Unfortunately, the model number is unable to be read. A service technician has provided you with the CFM and delta T of the unit. Now this time, you have a CFM of 2,000, and you have a delta T of 18. So using your CFM and your delta T and the airflow formula that you have, go ahead and pause the video and work through the solution. And when you think you have a solution, go ahead and play the video, and we'll walk through it together. All right, now that you have a solution, let's walk through it. Let's check our answer. So again, the first thing that we need to do is use our equation and write that sucker right down at the top of your paper. BTU equals CFM times delta T times 1.08. The second thing I'm going to do is replace my variables. So my CFM is 2000. My delta T is 18. And now I'm going to work the formula. Again, I'm going to bring down my 2018 times 18, work that out, it gives me 36,000. I'm going to bring down my 1.08 and do my multiplication. And my BTUs are 38,880. All right. So in both these cases, we were looking for, uh, we're trying to find BTUs. But what if, right? There's always that what if scenario. But 
So the examples so far have assumed that we needed to find the BTUs for, us, for our system. But what if we already know the BTUs if we need to find another airflow value? Right? Well, earlier I said that our formula can be twist and turned however we needed it to to fit the needs that we have for our airflow. Right? So all we have to do is rewrite the formula. So we can rewrite the airflow formula depending on what variables we have. If we have two known va values, we could find a third. So for those of you who are familiar with electrical systems or electrical formulas, this is just like Ohm's law. If you have two values, you could find the third. This is the airflow version of Ohm's law. So with that, to find BTU, and we know the CFM and delta T, then we use BTU equals CFM times delta T times 1.08. That's the formula that, we use, that we've used so far. But let's say that we want to find CFM. And we know the BTU and the delta T. We're just going to use a different variation of our formula, which is CFM is equal to BTU divided by delta T divided by 1.08. All right, so we flipped and we, re we redistributed our, our formula. So therefore, we threw in some division rather than multiplication. Well, what if we needed to find the delta T? And we know the CFM and the BTU. Well, therefore, the delta T is equal to the BTU divided by CFM divided by 1.08. All right, so again, just like Ohm's law, if we know two of the variables, we could always find the third by just rewriting our formula. All right, so let's give this a try. So scenario three, you have been asked to size ductwork for a furnace and the airflow that you need to size for is unknown. You do know the following. So BTU is equal to 58,320 and the delta T equals 20 degrees Fahrenheit. All right, so we have BTU and delta T and we're looking for CFM. So let me go back a slide. So if we're looking for CFM, so to find CFM, and we know the BTU and delta T, which we do, we are going to use the formula CFM is equal to BTU divided by delta T divided by 1.08. All right, so now that we know that, what formula we're going to use, let's go back to our practice scenario, and let's try to work this out. So go ahead and pause the video when you're ready and work through the solution. And when you think you have a solution, go ahead and play the video, and we'll work through it together. All right, now that you've worked through the solution, let's work it through. So just like before, I'm going to use, the, use an equation, and I always like to write down my raw formula first. All right, keep, it keeps my head in line. So my, the equation that I'm going to use is CFM is equal to BTU divided by delta T divided by 1.08. Now again, I'm going to replace my variables. So CFM is equal to 58,320, that's my given BTUs, divided by 20, which is my delta T, divided by my magic number of 1.08. Now I'm gonna work this problem. So again, I'm gonna start on the left-hand side here. I'm gonna take 58,320 divided by 20. Now I'm gonna bring down my magic number and I'm gonna work the math, work the formula, and back into a CFM, in this case, which should be 2700 CFM. All right, so one thing that uh, I, I always get confused with, even to the, you know, I've done this, this equation about a billion times, but sometimes, okay, all the time, I second guess myself, all right? So I wanna go through a sanity check, all right? So I'm gonna show you how to do a sanity check with uh, our previous formula using multiplication. All right, because multiplication, for, just for me, it comes a lot easier than division. So let's do a sanity check of scenario three. So if you're not sure if you've moved or rearranged your formula correctly, just sanity check it, right? So using the last scenario, we knew the following. So we knew that the BTU was 58,320 because that was given to us. We also knew that the delta T was 20 because that was given to us, and we calculated the CFM which is 2,700. So what I'm gonna do is 
I'm going to go back to the formula that I'm comfortable with, with trying to find BTU. All right, so I'm going to pretend that I don't know this number, right? But I know these two numbers. So with that, I'm going to go back to that first equation that we used, all right, which is BTUs equals CFM times delta T times 1.08. And I'm going to plug in the variables that I know based off of, of, first of all, what I calculated, which is 2700 CFM times delta T, which was given to me, times my magic number. And I'm going to work that out. All right, so now if I work the formula, again, do 2700 times 20, works it out to 54,000. I'm going to bring down my magic number. And if I did my math correctly, it should equal 58,320. And now I'm going to sanity check it. And my equation that I used to begin with matches what I used to find my CFM. Right, so therefore, this is a nice, quick, easy way to use a nice, familiar formula because for me personally, multiplication comes a lot easier than division for whatever reason, just the way my brain works. So therefore, I'm able to flip the formula, sanity check myself, and make sure that the formula that I use with all the division in it actually works by using multiplication. So that concludes this video for airflow uh, calculations. So if you are uh, in, a, in a class with myself or, or another teacher here, uh, we will give you some sample problems to work through. If you have a question or uh, would like some uh, example problems, please go ahead and contact me, and I'll be happy to email some over to you. Uh, in some future uh, videos, we will be talking about uh, airflow calculations and BTU calculations with regard to the efficiency of appliances and adding the appliance efficiency uh, into this equation as well, just to bring it to the next step further.